I'm Caitlin mm -hmm. and I'm a rising senior, so graduating in 2020. And my major is Urban Studies and International Studies. Um, I'm Sophia, I'm a rising sophomore and I'm an engineering major. We are studying Seneca Village, um, which was this predominantly African American community in New York City during the antebellum period. And they were trying to establish themselves um, by like buying property and kind of I think making like a sustainable community for themselves um, and the city eventually kind of kicked them out to build Central Park. So much of what we know about Seneca Village in terms of what survives in the archival record is little fragments of official documentation mm -hmm. because they're poor or sort of middle class because they're black because they're on the outskirts of the city there's very little by way of sources that they produce that survives 150 plus years the city starts paying really careful attention to seneca village and other neighborhoods in that area once it's time to kick them out and so task wise uh, we've been looking at property deeds and seeing uh, who purchased and sold property in Seneca Village um, and that was the first part of what we did um, and now we're looking at like networking in the community and seeing how these different people relate to each other and how they knew each other. Um, what I found interesting about like reading these petitions, just going off of what Sophia was saying, mm -hmm. is that I thought it was powerful to hear uh, people that have been for a long time like disenfranchised, like pushed to the edges of society, to tell their own stories. Um, and despite that being like going through a legal process um, that's like officially documented, it was still the power of people fighting for themselves um, and like. Most people didn't have attorneys to do it for them, so they, when they wrote their documents, they were telling their story and their needs and refusing to be ignored, which they had been for so long. Um, so part of it is, how do we get to the social lives of these people through these official documents that often seem like data points, seem sort of soulless? How do we tell people's stories, learn about people's lives? Then you start to see that in these seemingly mundane fragments of you know official records that aren't really supposed to be about people, we get these really intricate social lives. And part of the hope is also, this is a sort of future looking thing, but as I continue working on the book manuscript, the hope is that this will eventually be public. Like part of what I'm interested in is creating a publicly accessible resource for these archival materials because like I said so much of it is hard to find and what's easiest to find is and this is in some of the chapters that you know, you know the sections you haven't really been working on some of what's easiest to find is really negative and so it's easy to find these sort of propaganda pieces that talk about what trash these people are like literally it equates them to garbage to goats to the sort of swamps that they live next to so what I'd love is to put this stuff online as a sort of compendium to the book that eventually comes out and say, like, you want to research Seneca Village? Good. Start with this stuff. You know, pay attention to the newspapers that are propaganda against the community, but also pay attention to, like, these people and their stories and start with their perspective on things. And I think what you all are doing is really making that accessible, not just for me, which is a huge help, um, but eventually for future researchers, because I don't want to be the last person to write a book on Seneca Village. Right. Being the first is challenging. <laughs> Being the last uh, is not my idea, though. So, I think um, it's important to note how it's relevant today. Mm -hmm. So, we our time at the Connecticut Fair Housing um, will be mostly spent studying urban renewal in Willimantic, but we've been a few times and we learned a little bit about urban renewal projects in the past, and they're very similar to this. You see, like marginalized communities being displaced and a city being built and a huge question that comes up in our work with them is like who is the city being built for and that's something that we see happening in Hartford today so it's just still very re relevant I think and um, yeah I thought that was interesting seeing how it connected to our work with Connecticut Fair Housing and then what we see in Hartford and some of the issues existing. Mm -hmm.
Um, I think I've gained a certain sense of independence and uh, work, research independence. Um, and whereas before I did research for papers, but never really in depth. It was just like get the papers to do day, do your research, and that's it. Whereas now I have more time and more space and more of like a mentor or a leader to help me navigate what effective research looks like. Um, this project is a lot bigger than anything I've worked worked with or worked on. So when I'm writing or doing research for school, my information doesn't really go beyond like what I can find on Google Scholar or whatever, like these articles. Um, but this is an introduction to new types of sources, new types of like um, concept mapping or like piecing together information. It's just a very new approach. Like I, I've never experienced anything like this and I don't think I would have just um, existing and doing my Trinity courses.